Now we have an expert in Shane Bartlett, who's come all the way from Perth. Um, Shane works with uh, the Nuku guys and the Dockman guys, he's part of the Timber group, um, but he also has his own business, and um, yeah, he's going to talk about high performance drinks. So. Good morning, all. Um, all right, so the idea of what I'm going to be talking about today is thinking a little bit outside of the traditional lamp stack, so the Apache sort of base setup we often use. Also thinking outside of the traditional shared hosting that a lot of people use. Um, I used it until, I used it exclusively until a lot of years ago. Um, because I uh, traditionally, John was used for fairly small sites. Um, shared hosting on lamp stack was cheap and was efficient, it was reasonably good performance. And it was accessible, everyone could do it through using things like CPanel or Play, so it was very easy for people to run that kind of thing from anywhere. So the idea today is not going to get too technical, but to think about some of the things that you could do differently from what's been done traditionally that may actually help your site. It's an old saying, fast, cheap or good, you can pick two. So you can have cheap and good, you can have fast and cheap, and you can have fast and good, but you're never ever going to find fast, cheap and good. Just doesn't exist. A uh, little, little quote here from Google, um, and this is what started me on this path several years ago, is I noticed people like Matt Cutts were doing, who, anyone who doesn't know Matt Cutts, he's um, works with Google, has done for years, and speaks regularly about um, the search engine and SEO type topics. And something that's popped up a few years ago, he kept on mentioning was speed. Google's starting to place a little bit of emphasis in its search results on the speed of the site. So having a site that loaded in you know, five seconds used to be quite acceptable. In fact, having a page that with a whole page load took 10 seconds wasn't considered to be all that bad. Um, even now, a lot of people will say sort of three seconds is acceptable. But if you listen to a lot of what's being said, anything over a second is unacceptable, barring your local network performance or something. So Google actually had been studying for some time and actually announced officially a couple of years ago that it was definitely a part of the algorithm that ranks sites for speed. And that's what set me on this journey of finding out how I could make my own gym sites run a little bit faster. Some of the considerations I took at the time were cost, reliability. Reliability as an uptime. I didn't want something that was a new kind of block that was still a beta version that was going to fall down. Flexibility, something that was easy for me to change by applied news. Performance, this was what got me there in the first place. I needed that good performance. Administration, I didn't want to be spending thousands and thousands of dollars on you know, engineers and that to keep this thing running. It needed to be fairly simple to keep running. Likewise support, redundancy, I needed ways in which I could keep things up if something went wrong, and likewise backups. So if we have a look at the original stack, which is it, and who here knows they're using a lamp stack at the moment, so they've got their sites running on an Apache setup. Shared hosting, everyone using shared hosting at the moment? Who's using dedicated servers for most of their work? Um, cloud servers? Cloud servers? You're using everything. Yeah, <laughs> everything. Okay, so the traditional lamp stack, which is still a, a very viable setup and a very good, and it's a proven setup, and there's lots of people that know how to use it. So. It actually ticks a lot of those boxes. The problem I had with an Apache setup was that Apache it was a solution that did everything for everyone. As soon as you try and be all things to all people, you start adding stuff that isn't used by people, and you become a little bit like a Microsoft Office program where 90% of what you offer is only used by 10% of the people using you, and then the other 10, the other 90% of people are only using 10% of your offer. And that's what I thought Apache was doing. It was going down that road of being a little bit too much. I, for example, to give you an example, I don't believe that a web server and a mail server should be on the same physical machine. Um, the cost of data, dot, cost of um, processing power, the cost of um, storage nowadays, there is no excuse to have email and web on the same server. It's, it's ridiculous. The cost is so cheap now, if you're using, if you're using cloud servers, which I'll come to, that to have one site per web server is actually financially viable now. It wasn't once upon a time, unless you're a big company, but it is now. So 
I went through and I started off looking at the actual web server itself. And there's a few out there. There's Lighty, um, there's Lightspeed, there's one called Nginx, which is what I'm really talking about. And of course, there was Apache. I read everything that was available to read as of about two or three years ago on, on the various web servers. And I came down to one that's affectionately known as Lighty. You'll see it as Light HTTD. Um, it's known as Lighty as a short name. And Nginx, which is N G I N X, but pronounced Nginx. And those were the two that I settled on and I started playing with and doing my own benchmarks where I was using environments I was going to be using, so predominantly Gemini. And at the end of it, they were very, very close, but the one that I settled on for various reasons was the Nginx. And the main reason for that was it was marginally faster. It ran on a tiny footprint, so the memory use of CPUs was tiny. Lighty at the time had a memory leak problem. It was building up memory usage, and so it caused problems there. Also, at that time, I don't know if it's changed, Lighty, you needed to use Lua in order to write your HTTPS um, the type rewrites and stuff. I believe that's gone out of HTTPS users that actually still have HTTPS now. So that was, I'd settled on Nginx, and I started thinking about um, the database. I'm like, we'd always traditionally used good old MySQL. It'd been around for ages. Everyone knew how to use it. And MySQL was actually going through a bit of a, a, a change. It was just being bought by Oracle. Um, developers had moved on and created their own version of MySQL. MySQL itself was still there with Oracle. So I decided to have a look at that. And I looked through and actually ended up with one called Bacona, which is a drop and drag and drop replacement for MySQL. It is actually MySQL. Bacona is a commercial company. It is to MySQL what I guess you could say, um, I was going to blank, but Mark Shuttleworth and his crew are to Ubuntu. So they basically created a number of libraries and extensions to MySQL that improved performance specifically on the NODB table structures, which MySQL was moving towards. And, and so I settled on that. I did a lot of benchmarking once again. And I, I played around and I ended up settling on Pacoa. The next thing that came up was a little thing called FPM, which at that stage was an add-on module for PHP. So PHP traditionally under a lamp stack would be running under fast CGI and was quite efficient in doing that. But some developers at that stage had also done the fast F S S CGI process manager, so that's the FPM. What it allowed, um, it, it basically gave, it took PHP to another level, just a little bit more, but all these things were little incremental things that once I put them together were quite good. Um, and the last thing was I still needed mail transport on the server. So I, I got rid of the, the mail server as such. There was no mail coming in. I just needed a, an MTA just to to get the, the mail out from Java. So for that, I used Exxon, which is made by Cambridge University. It's a very lightweight little thing. It's got a, um, basically a drag and drop replacement for send mail, which is perfectly compatible with the traditional Apache type send mail. In my Linux, in those days, I was actually excuse me, using the Ubuntu server predominantly. I've actually recently moved away from that and using Debian. Um, my main reason for that was Ubuntu tended to be cutting edge. Now, that, you know, two years ago, I wanted to be cutting edge. I wanted to always have the latest and greatest PHP and stuff like that. The problem is you've also got all the bugs that come with having the latest PHP and so forth. So by moving to Debian, Debian tends to hold off a little bit before they implement their versions. And so we end up Obviously, there's also SendOS, Red Hat, Cloud Linux. Personally, there's fanboys for each. Um, use what you're happy with and what you're familiar with. I happen to be in that Debian Ubuntu type stream, but I've got nothing against SendOS. I just have never used it a lot, and so I'm not familiar with it. And given I've got to manage these things, I need to use what I can. So, Nginx. I'm going to start with the, the bottom of the stack, or actually, I guess the top of the stack. Um, Nginx has been around since 2002. It came out of Russia originally. As of January this year, it was the second most used web server on the internet. So it actually overtook IIS. Only just, but it's there. Nginx takes a very lightweight approach to serving web pages. Um, it's by no means got anything close to the feature set that you can get out of Apache. It does a really small task, which is serving web content, and it does that, in my opinion, better than any other platform out there. But it doesn't do anything else. It just does that one thing. It can work as a reverse proxy. So if you do have um, 
in an Apache, if you if you actually start with an Apache server, you can't get out of that. You can actually mm -hmm. set nginx in front of that as a reverse proxy, serving your Apache derived PHP driven content as well as serving directly the images and static files. Static file delivery, nginx does better than any platform partner. That's just it just does. Um, it can stream flash video out of the box. It's got a, a quite a good small feature set. Um, it's very, very light in memory, which I mentioned earlier, and it'll come down to track why. Um, static file performance is good. It can do streaming really, really well. So it's very, very lightweight. And one of the big differences is that in conjunction with NPM, it's not managing PS PHP processes the way. Uh, uh, PHP runs as a module within Apache, so Apache actually manages to a certain degree your actual PHP process management. That no longer is the case in this setup. Nginx is doing one thing, which is managing the delivery from the server to the end user, and that's it. It doesn't associate itself with anything else. One of the really cool things which we're um, looking at at the moment, we're actually been playing around with Nuku's caching mechanism. Um, sorry, not Nuku, Joomla's caching mechanism. And one of the things we're looking at is using um, memcache a little bit more because Nginx can actually access memcache directly. So without triggering a uh, process in PHP, you can access memcache directly and, and deliver that as if it was static content out of Joomla site. So obviously, you use Joomla to potentially manage that content and the creation of that um, caching. But then Nginx would actually access it and deliver it to the end user without having triggered any sort of Joomla stroke PHP process at all. These weren't very scientific, but it's just an example across the board uh, something I found which was interesting, a German hosting company does some benchmarks on common um, platforms. Um, Schneller means faster, so basically small is good. Um, so you have WordPress and using NGX about 46% increase on WordPress. Joomla if you look 25%, which is that's a good increase. I mean if you're running a if your process for generating a page is capable taking I don't know, 800, 900 milliseconds, you can drop that by 25%. It's, it's quite cool. So, um, yeah, I just threw that in there. It would be interesting. So, the next thing I looked at was Picone, which was the database side of things. Its query speed is exceedingly good. It's way faster than um, MySQL on its own, particularly if you're using NODB tables. So, my saying it's not, there's not such an improvement on that. Um, They've improved the scalability. So if you have an application, or if you're actually doing um, a SaaS type application where you're going to have quite national growth, eventually you may have sharding, but you're not going to have to use sharding until way, way further down the track than you would traditionally. Uh, it has far better logging. So if you ever debugging MySQL problems, logging is good. The other thing is actually used again, and it's a bit common. It's using way less memory um, than um, this is from Picona themselves, but this is their test. Basically, there's two things that you're seeing here. One is that the actual throughput of the queries is 40% faster, and this was on, incidentally, on a NODB based queries. The other thing which is interesting is that in the blue line, which is MySQL, those drops are when it's doing checkpointing by MySQL, which MySQL does this all the way through. It's running, and so those little points when they're happening, actually, are where you're going to get decreases in performance whilst it's doing the checkpointing. You don't get that component; it's managed in a different way. Most people have never heard of Picona, so just to give you an idea of who else is using it, some of the sites that are out there that are actually already running on Picona. So we're not talking about some little thing I found in the closet somewhere on the internet. This is actually a true and fine. It's actually a commercial company, which I kind of like because. I like the idea that if I really need to, I can get commercial type backup. Um, okay, so next step in our little stack was the PHP. Um, one of the good things that PHP FPM does is the adaptive process spawning. So what it's doing is actually spawning new processes as required. You set parameters which are telling it how sort of what its limits are, but it's not. It's running these adaptive processes so it can adapt to the, the stress that's coming or the queries that are coming into the server and fluctuate what it's doing. And thus, it's actually taking a small footprint as well. Again, it comes down to memory. It can do graceful um, starts and stops if you ever tried. You used to have to, for example, restart Apache in order to restart PHP, in order to restart mm -hmm. Flushy Case, for example. Um, 
you can just do a reload of, of, of NPM without actually restarting the, the server, for example, or the, the web server and that kind of stuff. And you can configure each of these worker processes to run on their own UID um, and PHP. And so it's kind of a little bit like Service Act if you're using that on um, a little bit more traditional thing. It has that kind of stuff built in. The other tip I found, and this was that like was traditionally we've all run um, our MySQL connections and also a lot of different connections used through a TCP IP pipe. Now what's happening in that? I don't know if anyone's familiar with OSILO, but that's a whole structure that gets sort of interpreted through packets going through TCP IP, which was happening to, to your data connections. Now by running um, PHP and that as a daemon, so it's actually a socket on the Linux machine, you actually get a speed increase just, and this is like a, a 30 second change in your setup to make this happen. All the tools that do it are there, but this little setup will increase your site speed by about 10 to 15%. And it will take you about five minutes in a minute, as long as you don't have access to do it. Lastly was Exim. So Exim was this, it's purely there to send outgoing emails and that's it. I don't use it personally for any other purpose. As I mentioned earlier, I don't have any other server type processes running on the server. So a web server for me is a web server and that's all it does. And then I had a look at the actual hardware and at that stage, I was sort of toying up between VPSs and dedicated servers. I had a couple of dedicated servers in house couple of VPSs that I was getting from various companies. Um, they're all really good. In fact, were, there was no problems with anything except they cost a lot of money. Um, they were prohibitively expensive, particularly if I was wanting to run a site per service. So each one of my clients had their own server set up specific to their own needs, with their own little tweaks and so forth. They might have a staging site sitting on their server adjacent to their production site and all that kind of things. And I, I went through the dedicated process thing and then two years ago, I think, both Rackspace and Amazon, companies like that, were starting to push their, their cloud offerings. And for me, it's been Rackspace, although I've played around with Amazon as well. Rackspace for me was kind of was always sort of like a starry eyed one day I might be good enough to use them, and their cloud offering is incredibly cheap. I can, I'm now running for multiple clients using this stack. Um, dedicated cloud service using the stack, one site, one customer per server, and it costs them about 15 to 20 dollars a month, depending on um, the bandwidth that their site's using. And at that cost, 15 to 20 dollars a month, that's actually, and the same can be done with most of the other cloud offerings that are on the internet nowadays. This is where you've got to think outside the square, because this is really, really cheap, and this is really attainable for small businesses, and there are loads of benefits. They're no longer going to fall victim to, for example, uh, a server which has a bad site on it, a site that's showing through their own processing now. They're not going to, they're, they can't, they're isolated more than they would be in a normal um, VPS. Um, they are still a virtual machine, but the isolation is a little bit better than what it is in a VPS. The only downside is that it's unpredictable billing. You don't really know what's going to happen if you had a sudden massive Influx of users, your bandwidth's going to go up and your bill's going to go up. But to be fair, it's 15 cents or 12 cents a gig. It's not, really, really not, it's not going to kill you. Um, you can also scale cloud servers incredibly easily, incredibly well. We've been playing now, um, and this can, again can be done in any environment we just have been using Rackspace with using their load balances with anywhere from two to a dozen Nginx front facing servers sitting behind the load balances. We're putting Bacona on a separate service, a couple of a master and slave servers behind that. And given the budget that we're using, we're doing that with one place we've got six servers, front end servers, low balance to six servers, and then two uh, database servers. And we're running that whole setup for about $120 a month. And this is a site that gets hundreds of thousands of visitors a, a month. They were having problems, they had an in house IIS setup, and that moved to this and improved their page speed from. About, about a 15 second page load down to a one to two second page load. Um, and they're doing it at a much lower cost. They've so not got <laughs> high cost Microsoft people having to manage the services. So, a little bit of a comparison, which was um, which, this is my what I put together myself. So, going back to that fast, cheap, and good. And you'll see that 
VPSs and cloud are actually not that far off from having all three of those things, which have always traditionally been unattainable. So, some closing thoughts. As I said at the beginning, the idea here was actually to get you guys to think a little bit about what you've been doing traditionally. So traditionally, it was a shared lamp stack, and it was done because most, a lot of um, it was cheap. You could get, you know, the site brand would be a bad one, but I used Rockin for a long, long time. Um, started off with their shared hosting resale plans, moved on to a virtual server, and it was actually from then that I came to what I'm doing now. Um, but we're actually doing far, far, far more for roughly the same cost we were doing with Rockin. And this wasn't that possible 10 years ago. It's only in the last sort of three or four years that this stuff's really become possible at a reasonable cost. The same thing is obviously judge each site on its own merits. If you've just got, you know, some some sites don't need this. They just, they, they are going to always be okay on a shared hosting environment. The little business card sites for the corner store or the beautician down the road, they do suit a shared environment. This isn't for everyone, but um, as an example, one site that we had on here was SciTech, which is kind of like a um, like powerhouse museum here. It's sort of the equivalent of Fair Data site called um, ScienceWA, which is a big site. It's about 40,000, 50,000 hits a week, I think it is. And we put them onto one of these things, and they had a, a massive improvement in performance, much less downtime as well, not having downtime problems. Um, so the thing about this server administration, the drawback in this is that you are administering your own service and you can't budget. And it's one of those things where if you don't dot, dot the I's, cross the T's and that, you're going to come unstuck. Someone's going to get in there and make you look like a fool. Um, learn the stuff. The thing is that it doesn't take long. No, you guys are obviously all technically apt. You obviously, everyone who runs or programs Jimmy sites obviously knows what they're doing technically. This isn't a, a big jump in there, and it's something that most people could attain fairly quickly. There's tons of courses you can do, there's tons of online material. Places like Web Hosting Talk, Whirlpool, um, the various um, <coughs> forums and support mechanisms for the products that I've talked about are all really good places to get uh, really good, valuable information on how to do this stuff properly, particularly when it comes to hardening the server. A lot of the hardening stuff, um, making it secure, is actually outside of what I've just been talking about. That's just your server 101 that you've been doing, regardless of what stake you're actually in. Um, so, yeah, I'm, the thing is, think about what you're doing, think about your sites, think about where this might actually be viable. And I would so encourage everyone to have a go. You can get your own Amazon or your own Rackspace or whatever cloud server will cost you 15 bucks a month and just play. That's how I started. I was doing all this stuff on cloud servers, just playing around with different servers to see what would happen. If I made a mistake, I killed the image and created a new one in five minutes, and I started again. Um, I took snapshots of images. Um, something which we're doing in my own business at the moment is um, myself and the techs have been putting together base cloud images specific to Joomla. So it's, if you imagine we've got a, an image of a cloud server based on a similar standards for our Joomla sites, and whenever we have a new one, we just write out a new image, it takes five minutes, new server, new image ready for that. We know all the work's done, we can maintain that base image and improve that. We're going down the track of using Puppet, investigating and using Puppet now to manage them, and getting a bit too, more, too many to be able to manage them, without help. Um, yeah, think about what you're doing, and I'd so encourage everyone to just have a play. It won't cost you much, and the benefits could be actually quite huge to you, your businesses, your customers. And improving both site performance, SEO is actually directly related to how I got into it. Any any questions? Shane, you, you mentioned the Puppet was. Um okay, Google DevOps. Puppet is um, basically for managing infrastructure, so <laughs> There's another one called Chef, which you will also see. Um, they're basically mechanisms whereby you can to use Chef, um, in which you create a recipe. So you can imagine all the bits and pieces of how you configure a server or a recipe for that server. Using Puppet or Chef or any of these other ones, there's a couple others. Um, 
that recipe is something that you can repeat and you can modify. And if you've got five, if I have a recipe called Joomla, which is my Joomla stack recipe, I could have all these servers that have been built using that recipe, then I can modify the base recipe and apply it to all those servers. So it's a really nice way of we can by doing this we can sort of have our test environment or our staging environment for our base image and we can apply changes to that, make sure it's not going to break Joomla or WordPress or Drupal or whatever's running on it. Test and configure away, modify that recipe and then push those changes out to a whole farm of other servers that are running it. So it's basically for managing a large number of servers. We're at about 12 servers now. They're all cloud servers. So we're not actually got a lot of them, but it's got to the point where to manage them efficiently to apply updates rather than having to apply, use general into each one, we can basically do it. Uh, and the, 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 that one's been a bit of a learning curve because by the partnership we've written Ruby, and yeah, Ruby runs better. I've actually got much better because our internal we use Redmine for Chile project for project management, which is very good as well. Through that, I've got a bit better. But our first probably three or four attempts at using public and then a crying heap just because we're going to get rid of it. Anyone else? Uh, Anderson, do you should be like Zealand down, I've been very wary of anything that's BPS based. How does Cloud compare to that? Anything that, sits, anything that sits on a server, on a physical bit of hardware, can go down. Which means that every site can. VPSs are not necessarily more prone to going down, including in that instance that you talk about, than any other mechanism that you put on a site. It could be a dedicated um, server, a VPS, or a, um, a cloud server. Cloud server has a small, a very small advantage in that it shares processing power and it can share storage space with a, a bundle of other servers. But it's still specific, it's still identifiably on a single server. This is something that people don't quite get. People think when you have a cloud server, it's completely virtualized. It's not quite, it's still, each site I have actually has, I guess, a host server where it sits. The resources it uses to run can be pulled from other machines, but it still has its sort of mothership where it sits. Same as a VPS, same as a dedicated server. And in, and in, and in being so, it's still possible to break the hardware or break things that will break all down. Um, but VPSs are not specifically more prone to that than anything else, more of cloud servers. Clouds do go down from time to time. Amazon's had problems. Oh, anyone who uses Dropbox will know from time to time it's just collapsed. They're on, um, Amazon's cloud services. So you're never 100% fail safe. Um, but in the same side, we, at a cost of about 16, 15, 16 cents a day, have a complete server image backup. Forget the key of backup. Mug scan. Too hard, too hard. I hate JPA files. I don't want to download it. Our cloud servers are completely as a server backed up every day. Cost me 15 cents a day. Where is the backup story? On their file systems. In our scenario, they were actually going into Rack's place as a cloud offering, but we now also put a copy onto Amazon. So we actually have it in two different locations. No, that's Someone got in and destroyed their own file system. Once again, that can happen in anyway. Sony, PlayStation never got hacked, banks get hacked every day. I never, I can honestly say I never did anything wrong, but back in the 80s, I cut my teeth as a hacker. I was using a piece of paper modems and trying to get into libraries. <laughs> and we got it. I'm like, where there's all this way someone will get it. You're never 100%. You make sure you've got fault tolerance and backups that are going to allow you to A, get back up again, and B, get back up again in a reasonable time frame so that it doesn't impact people. Um, I lived through a baptism of fire. Years and years and years ago, I used to share hosting. First share hosting come overused. Turned out in hindsight, they were running out of some dormitory. In, a university in the US somewhere. But one day we came to work, we had 100 clients on that, it was all gone. And I'm like, it was just gone, there was nothing. The, the hosting site was gone, our sites were gone, everything was gone. I'm like, what's up with this? I've got a client being left, right, and center. I'm like, I don't know. Um, and so I learned very back then, I'm like, you need to make sure that you as an individual, as, as web developers, as hosting, whatever you're doing, you're responsible for your own destiny if something goes wrong. So if you have it backed up, if 
if you haven't thought through your process of fault tolerance and redundancy, it's your responsibility. And if your hosting provider goes down and you've lost everything, it's not their fault, it's yours. You can only be so careful. I'm like, this company went disappeared. It was a reasonably big company. I'm like, Whirlpool for I'm not Whirlpool. We're posting to forums. On the day when this happened, there was a thread there with hundreds of people, if not thousands of people going, what's happened? And then someone who happened to be in the same city, which I think it was Pennsylvania or somewhere in the States, went to the physical address where these people went to be and found it was actually on a university campus and it was a dormitory. Um, you can be anyone on the internet. But it comes back to, you've got to, you've got to take responsibility. It's not their fault if it goes belly up and you lose your, your clients. It's, um, it's your fault for not doing it. And I've been bitten so hard on that occasion, which was like nine years ago. Um, never again. So I make, we do these daily backups, which is through Rackspace to their own file service storage, and then we have a copy that automatically goes from there over to Amazon. So it would actually take for both instead of full down. We're actually putting in, this is off topic a little bit, um, Rackspace have a thing called OpenStack. OpenStack is a, it's their own cloud system, which is, runs this. About a year ago, they teamed up with NASA and open sourced OpenStack, and Spend money now as an open source. Every man who's dog jumped on HP is involved. Um, Dell's, Dell, you can go and get a whole open stack infrastructure off the shelf. We're actually, because we've been developing a Joomla interface into open stack for our own internal use, we're actually now looking at taking the next step, which we're actually having our own open stack cloud based either, actually just over an Ultima or here, or over in Perth at the data center there. So we're outsourcing the data center in terms of the car location, but we have our own hardware there running our own cloud. Um, gives us that extra little bit of, um, and we're actually getting, in our case, we're getting Rackspace to actually do the initial setup and train people and stuff. But yeah, I, things like what you're talking about, it'll happen regardless of what sort of technical back system you're on. You can have it just to make sure it doesn't hurt you as badly as it probably hurt other people. Better off if you look after your own server. As opposed to having someone else in the drawing building from yours. I'd actually yeah. disagree. I'm actually my background is I'm actually a, an MCSE. I'm Microsoft certified engineer, and for ten years I was a Microsoft server manager. So um, it's a mugs game. System administration is horrible, and unless you've got the time to do it and do it properly and maintain it, it it's a horrible place to be. We are managed we. We've drawn a line where we're comfortable doing it. So we're at the moment, we're managing the actual server itself, but we're employing other people to take care of the hardware, the day-to-day. -day. You know, if you really want to do stuff, you're going to have the security, the, the backup power generation, and all that kind of stuff, the air cooling systems, and all that kind of stuff. Good on you, but I'm you not know. sort of talking in the physical sense, but I mean, comparing a dedicated server, really, you know that if, if something goes wrong in that box, because you've let something happen to it. Yeah, I'd rather not. You let something happen to it. In the virtual world, um, like I, I just recently migrated a whole bunch of sites from I, off IX web page yeah. onto a dedicated server. Because all of their sites, quite a few general sites, but they've all been, been basically compromised. And we don't think it was because of anything they did. It was more likely something else that went on somewhere within the Quite possibly. Um, my, my, my my thought on something like that is, to, to do an analogy, I'm, a, I'm as mechanically inept as you can possibly imagine. When it comes to what's under the bonnet of my car, I look in there, I just see a black box, I've got no idea what's going on there. Years and years ago, I used to go to, I, went, I can remember, I went to one place to get the car service, it meant to be a fixed price, $150. I came back, he told me it was $450. He had to replace all these cables that he had in his hand. I knew nothing. I had no idea what it was. So I just paid for one or whatever it was and took the car home. My brother was a mechanic. I told him what about him. He goes, yeah, we shouldn't have used that car for the start. He said, and this is from a mechanic, he said, go to Kmart. And the reason you go to Kmart is because their brand is worth millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. They are never, ever going to compromise their brand name through doing, for the sake of an extra 150 bucks. And that's why I use Rackspace and people like that, because you're using a brand that has millions and millions of dollars. And if you look at Rackspace, Media, Temple, Amazon, some of these bigger players, one-on-one, -on -one, some of the really big players, they're beyond trying to do something dodgy to save 100 bucks or 100 dollars here or there or anywhere. 
Um, I can tell you right now that their technicians are well trained and they're better than probably anyone in this room. I don't know your background, but and so I place value in that. I've got better things to do with my time than trying to manage a server where there are other people better qualified to do it. Um, can you build a stack like this just out of the box at rack space? Yeah, you can do it on your own machine. If you've got um, VirtualBox or something like that and you want to have a play, that's the best place to start. Chuck on VirtualBox, grab your Linux flavor of, of choice. Um, on nuku.org blog, or symbol.net blog, one of the two, I did a blog a couple of years ago on how to set it up, and I'm actually going to be doing another one shortly. Um, to set up the basics of that stack would take you, depending on your bandwidth, to get some of the stuff to come in onto the server, 10, 15 minutes. Right. You'll be up and running and able to fit and play. Um, and you'll be surprised, you can, you can set up your own little things. This is one of the things with Nginx, actually, it's exceedingly easy to administer, like the comp files that you use for Nginx are really, really simple. Something else you want to ask, someone will probably think of H, it's not HTAccess compatible, so forget your general HTAccess, it's not going to work. However, two lines of code and you've got all beautiful URLs. So it's, it's not hard, you can, you can do that, obviously. Um, with Nuku, we actually have, because it's a, a demo and a rest of face for the back end as well, we actually have some nice pretty URLs, both in admin and in the front end. And Nuku handles that quite nicely, so we have the nice full rest of the face in the back end as well as gives it a nice URL. Um, in terms of support, yeah. um, Nginx recently actually got an investment, VC type investment. So it had been a, an open source project for a long time, um, since 2002 up until about a year ago. I can't remember how much. It was millions of dollars, so it wasn't just like a couple hundred thousand. It was millions of dollars to basically take it to the next level. There are already big sites using Nginx. I think WordPress has been using it for a while. They use Nginx with Varnish sitting in front as a reverse proxy for it. Um, I know that, um, I can't remember, Aquius was, was Dresd's Drupal company. Aquia. Aquia. I know that they've been doing that with using Nginx as well. So it's, it's been around a fairly long time. It's 10 years old now, so it's fairly stable. Well, it is very stable. Um, and they just had a, a fairly substantial commercial investment into it to make sure, because there are big players using it. Google uses Nginx. So there's some big, big companies with a vested interest in that infrastructure where we're going to make sure that it's developed and continues. One of the big changes that will happen in Nginx is, was one of the downcomings. In Apache, you can install modules, Apache modules at will. So if you've forgotten to include PHP, you can include PHP. Um, Nginx, you couldn't. At compile time, what was there was there, and you weren't going to be able to add anything else into it. So if you, all the bases are there out of the box, you don't really need to worry. But if there was some extra bits, extra modules you needed, you had to have them in there at compile time, otherwise you had to recompile them. Um, that's actually going to be turned into something more drag and drops, like Apache. They're actually, it's quite interesting, Last, particularly since I got the commercial investment, there's been a lot more plans for Nginx, and they're quite exciting, because it seems like they're, to me it seems like they're cherry picking the best of Apache, or the best of Lightspeed, or the best of Lighting, and just bringing those things that are still true to their true cause, which is to web, serve web pages, but just the things that really make common sense to do. So it's actually quite interesting. I, I've got no concerns about longevity of um, that. Bikina and MariaDB. MariaDB is like some of the core devs from my school prior to Oracle, created MariaDB. They've actually joined forces a little bit. So they're actually working together now to push some of the stuff that we've kind of been doing in terms of improving the speed of site. So I have no problem there. FPM, whilst it started as something separate to PHP, as of PHP 5.3, it's now part of the core install of PHP. So this, you, you used to have to install it in addition to PHP, and now it's actually in there if you install PHP 5.3 or better, it's in there anyway. So that basic stack, I've got absolutely no concerns with it. Apart from the fact, I'm a little bit lazy sometimes. Like, uh, I look at what big players are using because people like Google, um, Yahoo, probably probably eBay as well, I imagine, invest a lot of money before they make a decision to pursue 
a certain avenue, particularly in technical, you know, if your whole platform is resting on it, you, you don't just jump in and do that one person's work. They will spend money and time and effort making sure it works. I used to work for, I see probably too young to remember a company called Gateway, which used to be a big player in IT, and I used to work for them when I was in Sydney. And before we went to market with anything, I got tested, tested, and retested, and quality checked. And there was a guy actually here, a guy called Hunter Beanway, who was amazing. He would rewrite the BIOS, like the old Phoenix BIOS from a, uh, on a Windows machine. He was in there rewriting it to make it tinker, to make it work with our hardware set better than it would out of the box. Um, so these big companies, they spend a lot of money. And so I, I follow what the big players are doing. And rather than spending 10 years trying to investigate something, you know, I, I used, I actually use, I know everyone likes Git, I actually use um, Mercurial as well. And one of the reasons, I actually went to Mercurial first, partly because for me getting from SKMs, the Mercurial seemed to be easier at the time to get into Git, it was doing ahead at the time. Um, but also, because Google was using it. And I thought, well, if I'm investing the time, it must be alright. I still now use Git and Mercurial. Anyone else? Um, that will be our question. Um, do you give your clients some sort of control panel to their hosting? Or? Uh, okay, we've just, yes and no. In that stack, no. They have actually no access to the server. We don't, we don't even put FTP on there. Um, the only access in is through Shell and SFTP. Right. So um, they want something they can do. That's what we're here for. Yeah. We, um, that's why they call us to do it. Um, we do, we're just about to go to market and it's six weeks with um, share hosting. It's, sort of, it's really just to get people in the door. Mm. But the, what made us do it, the reason we're doing it is because Plesk, actually Plesk 11, now comes out with an MDLT ability to actually run Nginx as a reverse proxy. So it's still running it actually, but it's got Nginx up the front, which does actually improve performance. And because we're using cloud service, we wanted to actually have a smaller footprint. Um, so uh, we're actually going to work with that soon. So, in that case, they have Plesk, obviously, they can get to it. But once we get to the, the um, dedicated power servers, they have the um, access one. So, second question was, where do you stick your client's email? If, if, you might if, if okay, most companies run Exchange, if they're yeah, a yeah, they're size. Not. If they're not, we will politely suggest, um, we actually use, and um, quite happy to suggest Google Apps as an alternative. Um, for those who are running Outlook and stuff, Outlook can connect to it, iPhones connect to it quite happily. Right. Um, Max, unfortunately, is still a bit of a fairy tale trying to get it to um, property. But if they still want something, we'll quite happily set up uh, a hosted Exchange server for them. We can just as easily run um, Exchange in the cloud as we can anything else. Okay. And as we're actually all originally Windows the same as we're actually capable of doing. But yeah, we. We, we, we decided early on that we were hosting websites and that was it. Mail isn't actually our problem, which is nice. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, seeing as though you're running effectively your own servers to manage websites, have you paid any thought to um, dual stacking IPv4 and IPv6 yet? Not yet. We're a little bit behind the eight ball. We haven't really gone into IPv6 properly yet. So the servers that we're actually now, because we're using Rackspace, the servers that we're producing are actually running on IPv6 and IPv4 natively. Um, but we haven't really invested much time in that. It's, it's on the to-do list. <laughs> um, but yeah, we probably will do. Just have a look at Just a quick one. Um, I've used Nginx and Vakona as well, and they are the performance is great for both of them. Have you ever actually encountered where you're, you've come to a solution where oh, no, I really do need a patch for this over Nginx because of, like you said earlier, it, it's got a lot of additional bells and whistles that some people want? No, but that's, we haven't yet, I'm not saying we never will, we haven't yet. Um, I thought I was at one point because I was trying to run some Ruby stuff on a, um, server that I set up for PHP. And at the time, I'd only ever done Ruby using a passion in Passenger, which is a, um, and I thought I had to do that, but it turns out I was able to run Ruby through Nginx as well. So, but also, I think, and this was part of going back to someone else's question, like, 
we don't host email, we don't host anything. We are doing one very small feature set and trying to, trying to do that well. And so with all that other stuff that Apache does, we actually for that I refuse to do. <laughs> so yeah. that kind of um, kills that one. We, yeah, we, we try not to, we try and do something very, very specific and do that well. And it does mean you can't do everything, but we're very happy with it. Is there something like PHP Live in the Kona? Um, the Kona is MySQL, so anything at all that you use in MySQL, absolutely anything that you can run that in. Yeah. In fact, the actual process, the process itself is MySQL. It, it actually identifies as MySQL. Oh. To MySQL D if you're looking at the process manager of Linux. So, if you imagine Joomla, you've added some extensions that made it better, and then you patch that up and send it out into the world, it's still basically Joomla, that's what they've done. So, you're completely 100% compatible. You can even, you can download, I mean, you can take a database that's sitting on the and just install it into MySQL and run it. It's, it's, there is absolutely zero problems with that. So, if you use um, um, my PHP mind, and I see one that's worth looking at. Okay, is, um, I've, got, I've got a new front end interface that even that's completely fine stuff. Chive. So it's built on U framework, which is another PHP framework. They're mm -hmm. um, really beautiful from my school. We're based on school. But yeah, you have absolutely no problems at all. Um, something else which you can look for if you want to have a, if you're on a Mac, um, it's MNPP, you'll find it on GitHub, and it's kind of like MAMP if you're using a Mac, and you're using Nginx, and for code actually. And we've actually forked it, because the guy, they've included Python and stuff, which we didn't want, so we've actually forked it, and we've actually released it. We're going to release it, we just call it it's called Engine, and it's just basically a map using Engine X. But there is one there you can use from out of the box now. It's got a bit more than what we wanted, so we're doing a stripped down version of it that we'll use internally. But um, if you've got a Mac, you can play with that. I don't know if there's a Windows equivalent to one. There might be. What's it called? MNPP. So it's Mac, Engine X, Picona, PHP. But it is unfortunately um, Mac only, but it's, it's the starting point um, that you can try. And VirtualBox or something like that, a virtualized local machine or else a cloud server um, is also good because you can just destroy and restart. Now, I've seriously built, destroyed and rebuilt hundreds of servers in the last couple of years, um, just playing around. Take an image I already have, set it up, try something, it breaks, I just kill the image and start again. Something cost me 20 cents or a dollar to do it. Um, but yeah, but the main thing is I really, really encourage you to at least at least have a play. If you're interested enough to come to this talk here, then I'm pretty sure that most of you will find it's a pleasant experience. Um, and it's not that hard. The, probably the hardest part of the learning curve will actually be Nginx's comp file, which is actually a really, really simple one once you understand it. It's actually incredibly powerful. And once you start writing comp files, they're actually a lot, they're very, it's like a C syntax. So if you're writing PHP and you're writing um, this comp file, they're actually almost identical in their syntax. They're actually quite readable if you're used to writing PHP. Um, anything else? Yes, um, Nginx on Google's SPDY project. Sorry, Google's SPDY project on Nginx? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not saying no, I, I actually just don't know. I'm not sure. Something I could try and find. <laughs> um, that's, that's about it. No last minutes? We're done. <coughs>